Even though the doors seemed closed and impossible, we all knew down deep inside that God was calling us to this. And God had called us to it, and it was time for us to step out of the boat. About the eyes of adoption. We'll continue on with it next week. Um, and there is our beautiful family, and we're going to talk about the process that we went through. But before we start that, let's open our Bibles, if you would, with me to Jeremiah 1 5. Jeremiah 1 5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So as I read that, I thought, if God knew Jeremiah before he was conceived, then he also knew you and me before we were conceived. So God knew us before we were conceived, and he set us apart. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call, me, call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. So God has thoughts and a plan for your life. God knew you before you were conceived, and He had those thoughts and the plans for your life from the beginning, before he created the oceans, before he created the land, before Jesus, before Adam and Eve. He had thoughts and plans for you in this place, in this time. And he had thoughts and plans for me. And just as he called Jeremiah to be a prophet of the nation, something that Jeremiah could never have imagined or dreamed of being, as he was living out his life and, and going out about his day-to-day -day business. He's also called each of us to something greater than we could ever imagine for ourselves. Amen. You're sitting here today wondering, what's next for me? Well, I can tell you it's probably something greater than you could even imagine that God is calling you to. It doesn't matter what your age is, where you're at, God's constantly calling us to go somewhere new and to do something bigger and greater than we've done in the past, to push us forward. Um, as long as we're walking on this earth, He's calling us to do something Amen. until we go home to be with Him. And so if you're still here and He hasn't called you home yet, that means He's called you to do something. And you still have work to do. Pastor Steve began the year preaching about our stories. If we think back to January, he started talking about how we all have a story. We all have a story to tell. So I thought I would share with you part of my family's story. The thing about all of our stories is that our stories are living. They're always in a constant state of flux. They're always changing. They're always adapting. Our stories, our lives are always growing and being added to. Then in, until we go home to be with the Lord and even then... We continue on for eternity, right? So our story doesn't even stop at death because our story continues in eternity when we'll be sitting at the throne of God just like uh, the girls were up here worshiping, worshiping God. That will be us as, as uh, Robert. That's his name, right? Yeah. Robert. As Robert prayed for us, that, that was his desire for us and, and the girls are living it out and embarrassing Shelley. <laughs> If we are following God's call, then we are also evolving into the plans that He has set out for us. But that's the choice that He's given us, because He's given us choice, right? We have the choice to either do what we're called to do, or the choice to sit comfortably, where we feel safe, and just live out our life. And many of us choose to do that. And it's our choice, but He has called us to do something greater. And if we are following the call that He has placed on our life, then, then we're following the plans that He has set out for us. 
The other thing about our stories is that each of us has many chapters of our stories. As we go throughout our lives, we have seasons. We just just, just at a conference and we heard a wonderful message about the seasons of our life and how we go in and out of seasons and how each season has a different role to play in our lives. We all have those seasons in our lives. Um, and some of our chapters are filled with extreme pain and sorrow, sometimes anger, and then other chapters are filled with joy. And some chapters are filled with a mixture of all of it. So today I'm going to pick up my family's story. I don't know why I'm emotional, but it is because it's our story. And I'm going to pick up our family's story and you will, you will see how that story is played out in our lives. Um, and, and how it's helped us to become who we are today because we're always asked, you know, how do you do that? How, how do you do all that you're doing? And, well, you're going to find out. It's not always easy, but we, we just do it. So this chapter began three years ago. And at that time, we could not, just as Jeremiah couldn't have imagined what God had called him to, we could not have imagined what God has called us to be and, and placed in our lives. And the story actually began probably about 12 years ago at a family reunion. And my aunt and uncle came and brought... Um, brought their granddaughters, my cousin's daughters, two of them. And we were at the family reunion, and just as always, Shelly was drawn to the children, and so we spent a lot of time with them. And uh, they grew in our hearts, and we had a special connection with them from that family reunion, just watching these beautiful little girls and, and the innocence of life that they had. And, and so we followed their life through my aunt and my uncle, listening to them, they would tell us how the girls were doing and what was going on in their lives. And um, so over the years, we would get updates once in a while. But because of my cousin's lifestyle and the lifestyle that the girls had grown up into, there had been some strife and separation between the families. And so we started hearing less and less about them. But uh, a little over three years ago, we found out that one of those girls was pregnant with triplets. And we were excited for them. My aunt and uncle always called us and, and told us what was going on because they knew that, that we prayed for the girls and we had this connection with them. So they were always filling us in. And she was pregnant with triplets. And so we were following the pregnancy and how things were going. And uh, about three years ago in May, about May, maybe a little earlier, was when we got a call from my uncle saying that um, my cousin's daughter was in the hospital because of the triplets. Having triplets it places a lot of stress on your body. So she had been placed in the hospital and was actually in there for a month before the, the girls were born because she had to have bed rest for a month. And then the girls were born, what, about two months early? Um, so the girls were born about two months after that. And so at the same time, my parents had decided that uh, they were ready to retire. And, and of course, we all know the expenses of living in California. My sister lives in Kansas City, and so they decided to go off to Kansas City to retire, where cost of living is about half of what it is now. And so they were able to, to buy a house out there and pay less for that than what they were renting um, here in California, and so it was a blessing for them. And so we got together, and Shelly and, and I and the boys, and we got together and helped them pack up, and we put everything on the truck, and we drove out to Kansas City and moved them out there that summer. And during that trip, while we were on that trip, we kept getting feedback from my uncle about what was going on with the girls, um, with the triplets and the, and the mom. And so they were actually born we got a call while we were on that trip that, that the triplets had been born and that they were doing well um, as expected with triplets. There were some complications and some things and so they were um, in the NICU and being taken care of and one of them was, uh, had to, they had to take them early because one of them was actually in distress and so they took the girls early and the one that was in distress actually lost more weight but, and took a little longer 
but eventually they were able to, to go home and I remember that conversation and I should have known then that something was going on because in the conversation Shelly said, oh, I'll take one. And I should have known because <laughs> when uh, Shelly says she wants something, God blesses her with it. <laughs> Let's go to Psalms. I want to prove this to you. We're going to go to Psalms 37.4 because this is part of our story, our continuing story. And um, it kind of worries me because I never know what she's going to say she wants next. But um, Psalm 37.4 says, Take delight in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. And so that proves to me that Shelley takes delight in the Lord because He's constantly giving her the desires of her heart. In fact, I drove one of those desires here to church today, our Lincoln Navigator, and just to prove to you of, of God's um, his willingness to want to give to us our desires, I'll tell you the story. It's a little bit of a side trip, but it was, I think, probably the same family reunion that maybe a different one later on, but it was, it was about the same time that the girls came to visit. My other uncle, my mom had seven brothers, so I have lots of uncles. Um, one of my other uncles, uh, his does pretty well for himself. He's a bank president and, and so he's always driving nicer cars and he drove this Lincoln Navigator to the family reunion. And one of my aunts had had a couple of glasses of wine and knew she probably shouldn't drive so she drugged Shelly out there. She knows Shelly doesn't drink too much and so Shelly hadn't been drinking. <laughs> Shelly hadn't been drinking and, and my aunt wanted to drive the car so she knew she couldn't so she handed Shelly the keys and said take me for a test drive and they go driving around and, and they pull back up and I didn't even know they had gone anywhere. I was out visiting with people and I happened to be there when she pulled back out, out and she goes, I love that car. I want that car. And I'm thinking, oh, okay. Thinking nothing of it. You know, it's just a nice car. It was a, it's a pretty, pretty car. And uh, so a few years go by and our family is growing and we've got three boys and they don't all fit in the back of the, the forerunner that we have. It's a little too narrow and so we start looking for a bigger car and Shelly still had that. She knew she wanted something big like a Lincoln Navigator or a, or a Escalade because Shelly likes to, and she deserves it, she likes to, to ride in style. And so um, I tried to talk her into like a Ford Escape or a Ford Explorer or something and she said, nope, I want an Escalade or a Navigator. And so we started searching. So I got online and I found some used navigators. I actually found one in Sacramento that was in our price range that we could afford. And so we were on our way to Sacramento to buy this Lincoln Navigator. And on the way down there, I decided to call the dealership that I had bought my Camry from just to see what they had. And uh, we had worked with them before and wanted to give them an opportunity. And they happened to have a Lincoln Navigator on their lot. But they wanted about 5000 more than this other one. And so we told them, okay, we'll stop at, at your place first and see what you have, and then we'll go to the other one. So we get there, and immediately Shelly falls in love with it. It's exactly what she wanted. It's white. It's got all the bells and whistles. It's got the light gray interior that she wanted. It had the, the split seats in the middle instead of the bench seat. It had split seats with a little, well, now it's a toy box so that all the toys go in. <laughs> Um, but it was exactly what she wanted and so we sat down with them and said, okay, we, we would like this, but um, it's a little bit more than what we want to spend. Uh, we found another one over here for this price and it's actually, the other one actually has less miles and of course, you know, the car dealer, whoa, no, you didn't find anything like that. And I said, yeah, we did. So we'll prove it to me. So uh, I go over to their computer and pull it up on his computer and he goes, oh, okay, I'll give it to you. We'll match that price. <clears throat> and so we got it. We drove home with Shelly's dream car. And we are driving around town one day. We went to the grocery, right after we got it, we went to the grocery store and I'm sitting in the car. Shelly's in, in Safeway and I'm looking through things, trying to find out where all the hidden things are. You know, when you get a new car, you want to push all the buttons and everything. And so I open up the middle console and, and hidden down below, I don't even know how I found it. It was hidden down below and in this little corner, I pull out this little card and it was a dental appointment card. And on the dental appointment card was my uncle's name. Oh, no. So we ended up buying the very car that Shelly 
had called into existence years before. Now the part that concerns me is because a couple years later he came to the family reunion driving a Jag. <laughs> Shelly also took that for a test drive and said she wanted that car. And I'm thinking I better get a better job because I'm not going to be able to afford a Jaguar on a teacher's salary. Come in SUV? <laughs> <laughs> we need a bigger one now, don't we? And so God has always given Shelley the desires of her heart, so I should have known, but of course we listen to things and don't pay attention. I should have paid attention when she said she wanted one of those little girls. She had always wanted girls, but we, all, we, we had boys, and so she had kind of given up on the idea of having girls, and we took care of the business so we wouldn't have any more kids, and um, we were all done. She had her nieces. She could take her nieces. She would do their hair, take them shopping. She, so she was, had her girls through, through her sisters and would adopt it, kind of adopted her nieces for all the girly stuff that Shelly likes. <clears throat> and so that's, that was life, and we were comfortable with that and living with that. But little did we know God had, um, God had other plans, plans that we couldn't have even imagined because we thought everything was finished and, and final. And so we kept up with the news of the girls through communication with my uncle. And after a while, the girls grew strong enough and they were released from the hospital. And um, we started to hear less and less about the girls, but we continued to pray for them. And then on May 7th in 2013, it was in the middle of word explosion. Um, I was leaving work in Yuba City and my uncle had called me. And we're, I was actually on my way up for a word explosion uh, for the evening service. And my uncle called, and it was at that time that we found out that the girls were placed in foster care. Uh, and they were looking for permanent placement for them. And all we knew at the time, all my uncle knew at the time, he had just found out that week that they had been placed in foster care. He was under the impression that they were placed in foster care in March. We would later find out that it had been longer than that. But because of the, the separation between the families, they didn't get a lot of the news that they were getting before. And so um, they were looking for a place to, to put the girls permanently. And my uncle called us, not thinking that we would take the girls, but he knew that um, he knows we're in church. He knows we know a lot of people. He knows that a lot of the people in our church do adoptions and uh, foster care and family. And so he was trying to get the girls out of the county that they were in and away from all of that and being placed in a different county and called us to see if we knew of anybody who could take the girls on a long-term um, permanent placement. <clears throat> and my heart sank when I, when I heard that they had been taken and got a pit in my stomach. And uh, so I came up here and, and before the service I was able to tell Shelly that he had called and told Shelly and the boys we told um, what told my uncle we'd do what we could. And I was talking to Shelly and the boys in and, and the conversation and told them what my uncle had told me. And we just kind of, you know, I had stuff to do. I was ushering and the praise and worship were going on. So we just kinda, I, I just kind of forgot about it and put it in the back of my head while I was doing other things. Um, and so during praise and worship, uh, Johnny, my oldest son, who was up here playing guitar today, he... Um, he came up during worship for an altar or something. I can't remember exactly what it was. And afterwards, he went back to his seat and he turned to Shelly and said, what about us? Um, and so when I heard about that, of course, I'm thinking, well, I can tell you why not us. We only have three rooms in our house and you take one room and the other two boys are in the other room and we don't have anywhere to put the girls. We don't have a big enough house for that, for one thing. That's our biggest obstacle, right? We, we couldn't do it. I don't think that we'd be able to do it. And so <clears throat> all of this was on our mind, and, and they were praying and, and thinking about, well, what about us? And her, her grandparents were here, and so we talked to her parents and grandparents about it. And from the time Shelly's grandma first heard it, she didn't really say much, um, but you knew something was going on. And so all of that was going on, and, and we're just kind of put it out of our head. It couldn't, we, there's no way we could adopt triplet 
little one-year-old girls. I mean, we were in the time of our life where the boys were getting old enough. Shelly and I could go out on dates and leave the boys at home. We could go to the movies and not have to worry about the boys. And you know, We could take the boys places and, and do things that we couldn't do when they were younger. And now we were at that stage in our life where we could start doing things and enjoying, enjoying them a little bit more and going places and doing things. And so you know, having triplets was... was yeah, it would be nice, but no, it's not something for us. It's not something we could do. Turn to Joel 2.28 with me real quick. It says, And afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And so never underestimate or disregard the words of our young men. In fact, we need to expect and encourage them to prophesy and to, to share their visions because they're from God. And when my son came back from the altar that day, I just kind of dismissed it as, it can't be us. But it was God speaking through him to us. Why not you? But we didn't know that at that time. And so... We sat there and we prayed and we were thinking about who could, who could take these girls. That's what's going through my mind. Through the girls and, or through Shelly and the boys, they're all thinking, okay, how can we convince Dad that this is a good idea for us to take these girls? And um, I started to spend every free moment between work and the kids, baseball, and grad school because I had just started grad school and I was in the middle of it. And that was another reason. I'm like, I'm in grad school. We can't do this. I don't have time. And so I start researching adoption and the process to see if we would even qualify to take the girls. And everything that I read was like, no, we don't, we can't, we don't qualify for that. We can't do that. Our house is this. No, we, it's not possible. We, I don't think we would be able to, to fit the qualifications for it. So we're going through this roller coaster and... Uh, Shelly and the boys had a strong desire to take the girls and Brady would even pray at night, God, please, please soften my dad's heart so that we can take the girls. And I kept saying, why am I the bad guy? It's not about me not wanting the girls. It just can't happen because I'm a realist and I look at the reality of things. And, and especially once I started grad school and started getting into it, because I hated reading before grad school, but it's something about getting in there and being forced to read. And now I'm all about reading and research and looking things. So I'm researching everything and finding all these reasons uh, that, that we can't do it. But really, God placed it the seed in my heart also. And when I was researching, I wasn't really researching all the reasons why we couldn't do it. I was trying to find a way for us to be able to do it. But the door seemed closed and impossible. And so, even though the door seemed closed and impossible, we all knew down deep inside that God was calling us to this. And God had called us to it, and it was time for us to step out of the boat. Let's go to Matthew 14, 22. <clears throat> Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is, not, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come on the water. Come, he said. And Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed back into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were on the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. We hear that scripture a lot, and we hear it a lot of times in the, in the context of when we're out 
in the water, we need to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. And when we focus on Jesus and not our situation, he'll keep us on that path. But the minute we take our eyes off of Jesus, we start to sink. Right? That's how we hear the story. And there's a good story about that. We also hear about uh, Peter, ye of little, little faith. And little faith was able to walk on water. It didn't take much faith to him to walk on the water, right? Because Jesus said he had a, a little faith. But I want to look at it a little bit differently. So here, here he is walking on the water toward Jesus in the middle of the windstorm. And the wind and waves crashing against the boat. And Peter steps out and begins walking on the water toward Jesus. We all know what happens next, right? He walks out and he starts to sink and calls out to the Lord, help me. He knew that, but before he got to that situation, what put him in the place where he was out there sinking in the middle of the, the lake? So first Peter had to step out of the boat. And he tells Jesus, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come on the water. He knew that if this was truly Jesus and not a ghost, then Jesus would provide him with the ability to do what he was called to do. When Jesus called, Peter went. No hesitation. Peter had to have walked a bit of the distance too before he lost his focus. He had to have been far enough away from the boat that he couldn't get back to the boat when he felt himself sinking. It was too far for him to swim back. He couldn't just reach out and get it. So Peter had been focused on Jesus long enough to get him a distance from the boat. In fact, Peter had to have been focused on Jesus long enough to get him within reach of Jesus. Because when he called out to Jesus, Jesus reached down and grabbed him. Jesus didn't have to walk to him to get him. Jesus didn't stretch his arm across the seas and become Stretch Armstrong. Jesus just reached out and grabbed him out of the water. So he had to have gotten to close enough within Jesus. Many times we're walking along the water and waves happen and we sink and, and we start looking at our situations. And Jesus is right there. All we have to do is call out for him to hold us up, lift us out of it, and we don't. We give up. And our breakthrough was right there. And all we had, to, he was there. He was there to pull us out of it. If he had gotten out of so, he had walked a distance. He had to walk far enough to get to Jesus. But think about this. What if he had not gotten out of the boat? Right? Wind and the waves are crashing against the boat. It's safe in the boat. The boat's rocking a little bit, but he's not out in the middle of the water sinking and drowning. The other thing that crossed my mind is Peter's a normal man. He's a regular man. What kind of regular man thinks, oh, Jesus, tell me to walk on the water and I'll go walk on the water? None of the other disciples had that thought, right? Maybe they had the thought, but Peter was the only one who responded to the thought. All right, so we don't hear about all of those things. We don't hear about those faiths. Uh, uh, those steps of faith that we need to... We hear about the success, right? So he's walked on the water, but he, if he had never gotten out of the boat, we wouldn't be reading about Peter walking on the water. We wouldn't have been reading about his little faith. There wouldn't have been a story about that. So the first thing he had to do was step out of the boat. And sometimes we just need to get out of the boat and step out of faith and not focus on what's going on around us. Jesus called me. I'm going. Doesn't matter what's going on. At that same conference we went to, we were, uh, had the pleasure of listening to Francis Chan. Anybody know Francis Chan? He's written a, a few books, popular books, and um, very good books. And he's a good speaker. And he got up there and we're ready for this eye-opening sermon. And he starts saying when, when he got there, he started thinking... Every time I come and preach, I'm telling everybody about the last six months or year and all the successful things that have happened to me. And so everybody gets encouraged. Look at Peter Chan. You know, all these wonderful things happen to him. People are saved. Peter Chan. Peter Chang. Francis Chan. <laughs> Francis Chan. I don't know why I said Peter. Peter walked on the boat, on the water. Francis Chan has people saved all around him and miracles happening to him that we're hearing about 
right? All these big speakers do. And so we hear about all of their success stories. But he said, no, we never get up here and share all of the failures that we've had to get to that point. And one of the things he said was, he was able, he, he said, I'm able to stand up here and talk to, there's thousands of people in this auditorium. He said, this is easy for me to stand up here and talk to you and share the word with all of you. Um, I could do this for days, he said, but the thing that, that is hard for me, the thing that I struggle with is when I'm sitting in that airplane, traveling somewhere next to, the, next to a person, and God tells me to minister to that one person and to share the word with that one person. He said, because I'm thinking of, well, what if that one person rejects me? What if he, it's hard. He said that's a hard thing for him to do, but he does it because God has called him to do it. He doesn't do it because it's easy for him. And he says that he's got failures all the time. He's, called, he's had people in his life that he's been with and for 10 years and shared his life with, and they've shared their life with, and then all of a sudden, 10 years go by, and they decide to go back to the life they were living before and leave him. And he said... We never share about those failures. We only share about those successes. But the one thing he always does, he said, is he steps out of the boat because God tells him to go do something. He does it. Not when it's comfortable, but when it's uncomfortable. Talking to that person next to him on the plane because God told him to talk to that person is not something he wanted to do, but God called him to do it. And so he does it because that's what God called him to do. Peter stepped out of the boat because God called him to step out of the boat. And now it's time for us to step out of the boat. And Shelly and I stepped out of the boat. Amen. And we had a family, a few family meetings, actually, when I kept hearing about how I'm the bad guy and my heart needs to be softened. And we had a few family, family meetings and we prayed a lot and, and we stepped out of the boat and we decided to say, okay, Everything says no, what's it going to hurt? We'll, we'll try the process. And so we called the, my uncle and he got us in touch with the social worker. And um, Shelly contacted the social worker and we started the process of qualifying for, the, for becoming foster parents. And so at first we're like, well, we don't have this, we can't do that. And, and the lady said, well, because you're family, it's a different system. And so you don't have to qualify under the, those regulations. So there's a lot of things that you don't have to have in your home or, or there's just different things that happen. So all of those walls that I kept seeing from my research were gone because we were family and so there was different regulations and stipulations for us. It was different. And so Shelly talked to the social worker and over the next few months we prepared for, prepared our home and made frequent trips to visit the girls. We're going down there every other week, it seemed like, four hour drive just to visit these, these three little beautiful girls. And sometimes we'd see them at my uncle's house and sometimes we'd see them at the visitation facility. But we were going down there quite often to see them and, and talking with the social worker and, and going through the process and, and having our house invaded by, by people who we didn't know and they're coming in and taking pictures of, of every corner of our house, the closets, the, under the beds and I remember Shelly feelings afterwards like she was so, vi would feel so violated because some stranger is in here taking pictures and taking notes on everything and, and they don't really talk to you about the process when they're going through it. Um, in fact, I had just decorated my son's wall, their bedroom and made it all giants for them and painted it orange and orange with a black stripe and white and it looks really cool and she was so impressed she wanted to take a picture of it not for the social worker stuff or the qualifying but just to show her her friends this cool room and so we were going through this whole process and the, so, the girl's social worker the whole time is telling us, well, there's another family that's also, they've already completed the process, but you guys are a better fit and you're a better match. You guys, this other family lives in an apartment. They're not quite um, set up to take the girls, he said, but uh, you, guys, you guys will probably get the girls because you're a better match for it. And so we kept going through the process and going through the process and visiting the girls and it was about their birthday. In fact, we were camping with uh, Stephanie and Aaron. And it was about the girl's birthday, so Shelly made little brownies. And we took the brownies up there and we sat around the campfire and sang happy birthday to the girls. And um, the girls weren't with us. They were down at their home, but we still we videotaped it. 
We have a video of us singing to the girls and, and Stephanie say, saying something about next year the girls would, this could be you with the girls and singing happy birthday with them here and with the family. And so all of this is going on and, and we just, we're pretty sure and we're confident that, that we're going to get the girls. And we go down for the visit around the girl's birthday and we had made arrangements to meet with the social worker beforehand because we had questions with, with triplets and the situation they were born into, we didn't know what was going on. We didn't know if they had disabilities. We didn't know uh, if they'd been tested for any disabilities. We had nothing. And so we wanted to go into this knowing what we were taking on. And, and we had that discussion because we didn't know anything. We had the discussion, well, what, if, what if they're Down syndrome and we have to care for them their whole lives? It's either 100% or nothing at all. And that didn't matter to us. We were still in, going into it 100%. No matter what they had, we just wanted as much information as possible so we would be prepared to help the girls however we needed to help them. And so we go down there and we meet with the social worker and we share our questions and she answers our questions and we go through all of that. And then at the end of all of that, she tells us, well, we've decided to place the girls with the other family. And so we're going to put them in long-term with the other family and we're kind of holding back our emotions and we're thinking oh my goodness we just went through all of this you know we just went through all of this questioning with her why didn't she tell us that at the beginning of the meeting why did she wait till the end to tell us all, all these things going through our head and we went on with the visit met with the girls thinking this is, might be the last time that we get to see the girls because they were going to go with that other family and the social worker said, oh, well, maybe you guys can be long-term care if they go on vacation or something. But we're like five, mi we're five hours away. That's not real feasible. But the social worker encouraged us, we'll keep going through the process. You never know what will happen. Something could happen. And, and we'll, so we became the backup plan. And so we left discouraged, heartbroken. Decided, well, we're already in it. We might as well finish out the process. But we weren't as... Um, enthusiastic about finishing the process and we didn't want to go buy a bunch of stuff now because we're getting ready to buy cribs and and all the stuff we needed for the girls and we didn't want to do all of that and, and invest all of that money if we weren't going to get the girls it wasn't we weren't trying to become foster care people for for just anybody we were called for these three little girls and if it wasn't these three little girls then we weren't going to that wasn't what we were called to and so we start, we continue through the process at a slower pace and kind of go on with life. And I remember coming back and Shelly sharing with her family, well, it doesn't look like we're going to get the girls. And Shelly's grandma looked at her and said, uh, God's got a plan. And, and God has called you guys to be the parents of those three little girls. You just trust in the Lord and keep your faith. And it doesn't matter what those other people are saying or what else is going on. You trust in the Lord and keep your faith. Amen. That's hard to do. And, and we didn't. And we doubted. And we thought that there wasn't a possibility anymore. But Shelly's grandma never did. And she kept praying. And it wasn't but a few weeks later that we get a call from the social worker saying something happened. And the girls can't go with that family anymore. In fact, the, they're not even allowed to have visitation rights with the girls anymore. We don't know what happened. We've never asked. We have suspicions and ideas. Nothing dramatic or tragic happened to the girls that we know of or think of. In fact, we would have known by now because they're ours. But nothing like that happened. Um, but something happened that God and I, I know what happened. God intervened, right? Yeah. <clears throat> And so God intervened, and we get this call, and they say, well, how soon can you take them? And we're like, whoa, wait a minute. We've, we're not ready for this yet. We've got a lot to do to prepare to take these girls. We, we've, got to, we've got to move our oldest son out of his room and prepare a place for him to stay. And we've got to uh, paint, the, paint the nursery and get the cribs and do all this. It's like, it's like preparing, you know, when you're pregnant, you have nine months to prepare to get this baby, and you know the baby's coming, you do all this stuff. Well, we had a couple of weeks to finalize preparation, and so we told her we weren't quite ready. And so she said, okay, well, the girls were back with the original foster parents, who were wonderful people, who took great care of them. And um, she said, I'll give you a few weeks to get ready, and, and then 
on this date they're coming to you. And so we, we start getting stuff ready and everything's moving again and we're excited again, but we don't want to be too excited because we just had them taken from us and now we got them and we're in, like, well, we don't want to keep going through this roller coaster. What if something else happens that we don't get the girls? And so we, we ended up going through it, getting the room ready, and on September 4th, the girls came to our house and they've been with us ever since. And so during that time, you get all kinds of social workers, right? The girls, they get a social worker for every phase of the process. And so when we first started, the, the social worker who was doing the placement for permanent foster care was one social worker. And the minute that they placed the girls with us, they went to a different social worker for a long-term placement. And this, the purpose of this social worker was to help prepare for the adoption. And so she said, um, she's the one that got us on that road to the adoption. So then we had to go through everything again. We had to go through a different agency who had to come up to our house and inspect everything and take more pictures. I'm like, can't you just work with... No, we don't work with each other. We're independent. And so we had to go through the whole process again. And through this whole process, you know, we were confident and, and the social workers confident saying the girls are going to be yours. You need to start planning for them to be yours. You need to start treating them like you're yours. And then, and then she would always end the conversation by saying, but there's always a chance that something could happen. And until you sign the final papers, the girls could be taken from you and be sent back to the parents. The parent, they always give the parents the right to come in. Now the county will provide them with attorneys and this and that for up until they lose their parental rights. Well, they hadn't lost their parental rights at this point when we got the girls yet. And so we had the date set to get their parental rights. Let's go to Proverbs uh, 3, 5 real quick before I move on and forget this scripture. This is a good scripture. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all ways submit to Him and He will make your path straight. And we had a hard time doing that, but we had somebody in our life that did it for us, Shelley's grandmother. And, and we wanted to, and we, we were still walking on faith, we were still walking out the path, but it doesn't mean the doubt wasn't there, and the discouragement, and the, and the pain, and the heartache, and, and all of that wasn't there. But uh, we trusted in the Lord, we kept on the path, and, and we ended up getting the girls. And so then we have the girls, and we're, they're living with us, and, and they're... We're going through the whole conundrum now. Well, what do they call us? Mom and dad, of course, because we're taking care of them. Well, what are they? Because we're still having to go down for visitation once a month. We're having to take the girls down to see their parents once a month. Well, what are they going to call their parents? Their, their biological parents. And we all of this stuff going through our head. And then we hit, find out that the termination for rights was going to be in January. We didn't have to be there or anything, and the social worker was going to call us afterwards and tell us, give us the update. And so the, the, the rights were supposed to be terminated, and we were waiting for the call, and she didn't call, and she didn't call, and finally she called about a week later saying, well, um, the dad's attorney filed for an extension. And so now they still have, now we've got to go through, I think it was uh, 90 days or something like that. It was another three months that we had to go through this process of wondering, why did they file for, for extension? And this and that was going through our head. And, and it turns out it was just the attorney doing his job, covering himself, because if he hadn't, then they could have come back and said, well, my attorney didn't represent me correctly. And so it was actually a good thing for us that that had happened. The parents weren't showing up for, for the court dates. And so we were, we were pretty confident that we were going to get the girls, but always in the back of our head. And every time we had that conversation, it was until they signed the papers, they could come in to the judge and say, hey, look, I've straightened out my life. I'm able to take the girls now. And the judge will place, could place them back in the family's thing. And so it's still kind of turmoil all the way up until June of last year. In fact, their birthday is June 21st. And on June 20th, we went to the Merced County Courthouse and signed our papers and uh, had this picture taken, and the girls became ours. And that was the moment that we could breathe and relax and know 
that there are girls. They have our names. There are girls. Nobody can take them away from us now. They belong completely and wholly to us. But this whole process would have never happened if we didn't trust God and step out of the boat in the first place. Just like Peter. If he would have stayed in the boat, what would have happened? the whole story would have been different. Our story for our lives would have been different if we hadn't have stepped out of the boat. If we hadn't have stepped out of the boat, several times throughout the process we were um, at a crossroad where we could have given up. When, when the first crossroad, when they decided to give the kids, the girls, to another family, we could have just stopped and said, we're not going any further. They're not going to give them to us. Why, why go for it further? But we didn't. We kept, we kept going. When they didn't terminate the rights, we could have, we could have stopped. You know, there's, there was these opportunities along the way that we could have stopped and taken our eyes off of, of what God had called us to at that time in our lives. And now we can't even imagine life without the girls. We can't even remember what it was like before we had them. We've had them for two years now, over two years now. Almost two years in September. <clears throat> and uh, we, we can't even remember or imagine life without them or what it was like. We try to think back. And it seems like a lifetime ago. It seems like they've always been with us and always been there. And that's the bond that, that God has created with us and them. Um, we walk into the room. I come home from work. And it doesn't matter what they're doing, wh where they are in the house. A lot of times they'll be in the living room watching Bubble Guppies, which is their favorite cartoon. And I'll walk in and they're watching that show. And I'll just stand there and wait. And one of them will see me. And she'll turn and run screaming to me. And then the others see what's going on. They all just run and attack you. Shelly goes to the store and she comes back and they go and run and attack her at the door. It's a feeling that you, you just can't experience unless you, you have it yourself. Um, but we had to step out of the boat and follow God's plan for our lives. Amen, brother. From the very beginning, God had His plan for our family but we had to trust, him, trust in Him to see it through. Shelly had always had a desire in her heart for little girls. And now God, she just wanted one little girl. And God, God tripled that. Gave her over and above what she, what she wanted, her heart's desire. So I'm still concerned about that Jaguar. <laughs> God has plans for each of us. He has called... Some of you to get out of the boat. He's called all of you to get out of the boat. And some of you are still sitting in the boat. Because the wind and the waves and the circumstances are, are pushing against you. And rocking your boat. And it's safe in your boat. And if you step out of your boat, you're going to be exposed to the elements. And exposed to the reality of what's going on. And that's a scary thing. But if you know, just like Peter, if you know that it's God calling you then all we have to do is keep our eyes on Him and he will, he will walk us through it. We won't even be, we think we're out there alone, but we're not. Jesus was out there with Peter. Peter wasn't on the water alone. Jesus was there with him. And when Jesus started to stumble, when Peter started to stumble, Jesus pulled him out. When we started to stumble, we had the faith of Shelley's grandmother keeping us going and keeping us faith. You know, we had our friends and family and loved ones constantly encouraging us and keeping us going. But you have a choice to make. Are you going to stay in the boat where you feel safe amongst the wind and the waves? Or are you going to heed His call and step out of the boat? God's called all of you to something. What has God called you to? What are you, what are you waiting for to step out of the boat? You just got to do it. Some of you in here have been called to usher. Which we do need ushers, by the way. And you're sitting in the boat saying, well, I don't want to usher. I can't usher. Francis Chan doesn't like talking to people next to him on the plane, but he does it because God's called him to do it. We don't always do things because we want to do it because it's comfortable for us. When we're following God's will, we're doing things that are uncomfortable for us. People ask us all the time, how do you do it? How do you, how do, how do you, how do you manage grad school and coaching the boys' football team and working full-time? and adopting the triplets, how do you do that? I don't know. I just get up and I do it. 
How did Peter walk on the water? If you ask him, how did you walk on the water, Peter? He said, I don't know. I just got out of the boat and walked. We sit in a boat and we wonder, well, how am I going to do this or how am I going to do that? I don't know. But I know if God has called you to do it, just get out and do it. And it will happen. God will provide the way for you. He will give you the ability to do what you need to do.